Pokemon has been played competitively since it first came out in the late 1990s, and unsurprisingly, it has not been immune to drama and stories that have gone under the radar. For every headline about Verlissify 10 years ago and every innocuous wolf glick thumbnail that people are bothered by for some reason, there are hundreds of other tales that don't trend on Twitter. This is a story of tournament collusion, fundraising scams, and the near implosion of an entire competitive community. But what makes it even more incredible is what set the dominoes falling was Meg Cargo finding a competitive niche for the first time in its life. Now before we get into it, there are a few caveats with this video. This is a story that directly affects me, so there's going to be some unavoidable bias. We all have our own perspectives, and this is one that I feel is fair, but it's colored by events that both had lasting positive and negative effects on me. The people discussed in this video no longer have YouTube channels. I felt it'd be unfair to name them by name given the fact that they scrub their channels, along with the fact that nothing in this story is particularly serious or warrants a call out, and it happened a decade ago. It's a fun story though. In 2010, I was in my last year of college. One of my roommates was really into retro games and kept up with industry stuff way better than I did. I remember him asking me if I knew about the new Pokemon games. Now, I hadn't played Pokemon in years despite having gone to tournaments as a kid for the first two gens. Ruby and Sapphire came out when I was in grade 8, and Diamond and Pearl dropped at a time where it could not have been less cool for me to like Pokemon, but I was willing to give it a shot. I started playing Pokemon Online, which only had the Japanese names for a few of the Gen 5 Pokemon, since the games were all 6 months away from being localized. While each generation brought its own level of power creep and pushed more and more once powerful mons out of the spotlight, Black and White did this at a rate no one was prepared for. On Pokemon Showdown, Pokemon are drafted into tiers based on their usage. This allows for a variety of metagames and a significantly bigger array of Pokemon to see competitive play. If Pokemon weren't separated this way, you'd end up with maybe 100 Pokemon max seeing some sort of play, and probably two dozen at absolute max if nothing was banned. Nearly all of the top tier threats this time around were Generation 5 threats. We had the Genies, Conkeldur, Genesect, Volcarona, Ferrothorn, and a billion new legendaries, and they usurped plenty of competitive mainstays niches and forced them to fight for leftovers in the lower tiers. This had a cascading effect, as it always does, because all of a sudden the previously strongest Pokemon were now in the same tier as Pokemon whose whole existence was that powerful Mon, but worse. This made Never Used, the competitive tier on Pokemon Showdown with the lowest overall power level, an absolute hellscape. Hundreds of legal mons and maybe a few dozen that were borderline usable. Bringing an NU ranked mon up into overused was often reserved for dumb gimmicks and clickbait videos, but the gap between strong NU and weak NU Pokemon was nearly just as wide. At the end of Gen 5's lifespan, an even lower tier was proposed to fix this issue, and, though it was kept as an experimental and unofficial ranking until Gen 6, PU is born. PU was the dregs. Pokemon had to have a nearly non-existent use rate in NU to be considered weak enough for PU, so it ended up being populated mostly by the not fully evolved, the chronically outclassed, and the stuff that had been considered trash since Red and Blue. PU is a fascinating metagame where unlikely heroes like Vigoroth could completely roll teams if unchecked, and Wormadam could act as an unkillable defensive linchpin. And because of the novelty of getting to legitimately use stuff like Behem as a sweeper, PU found a few champions on YouTube. They became the unofficial heads of the PU community, and helped build the scene rooted in the ideals of originality and personality, as well as the concept of gimmick as a virtue in the context of competitive play. PU was a tier with the most atrocious Pokemon imaginable. This was the place to experiment if there ever was one. The amount of nonsense you could get away with made for an incredible competitive experience. PU was lacking in the top rate player ability at the pinnacle of the ladder present in the more popular tiers, but because you had to sort of seek it out, most people who played were at least competent. Very few players who played PU were brand new, and instead were mid-level veterans who were looking for something more interesting. I made it my mission to start winning with my favorites in this less serious tier. Which brings us to the hero of this story and the reason you clicked the video in the first place. One of my favorite Pokemon of all time and maybe the absolute weakest Pokemon in the history of the franchise that ever saw any sort of competitive success, Meg Cargo. It's hard to overstate how bad Meg Cargo is. There's almost nothing relevant it can do that dozens of other Pokemon can't do better. It has awful stats, an awful typing, a barren move pool. To make Mag work, I need to get creative, and most importantly, I need to accept the fact that I could not rely on him solely to carry games by himself. Lots of the time when someone uses a crappy mod on their team, they're doing so with 5 other top tier threats that don't rely on the crappy mod to actually win games. They then farm hundreds of games for interactions with the worst players you've ever seen and pick 10 where the mon actually got off the ground and did something notable. But the goal here was different. It wasn't to make a strong team and have Meg Cargo riding the bench. It was to make a team where switching into Meg in a less than ideal situation wouldn't instantly lose me the game. So what was Meg good for? How do you build a team that highlights his strengths? <laughs> what strengths? He had slightly above average defensive stats and an access to reliable recovery, but his defensive typing was so abhorrent that it meant that it was nearly impossible to find an opponent that didn't have unresisted coverage moves. He walls no one, even in PU, so he needs to go on the offense. The strongest tanks in the tier were Vileplume and Laren, and most teams ran both, meaning that the combo of Earth Power and Lava Plume could hit both unresisted, allowing Meg to swing as a cleaner on Pokemon the opponent didn't want to sack and tag whichever wall came in for a decent chunk of damage and a very real burn threat. 80 special attack is usable in PU, but he had awful speed. He was gonna need some support to really threaten anyone. 
Sticking to the theme of using my favorites, I brought in Duotion to be a Trick Room setter. He's cute, and he's actually really good in PU. He's slow as shit, and he's got a truckload of special attacks so he could fire off nukes and set up Calm Mines if switching into Meg after the room set was a bad call. A Violite and Calm Mine made Duotion extremely hard to kill as Gen 5 did not have a ton of knockoff users. Every team had one, but the move was not ubiquitous like it's been in recent years. With Trick Room, Meg Cargo outspeeds nearly the entire metagame, but he's not really able to one-shot most threats, and he's not durable enough to slug it out over an extended period of time, so he needs a bit of utility. Recover is always a boon, but usually gets ignored on offensive Pokemon as they want that space for more coverage moves. But somewhat serendipitously, Meg Cargo does not have coverage moves. He's got nothing interesting or important to help him deal with mons who resist his stabs. Yawn paired with Recover made him a bit more annoying to deal with. Mag can now force switch outs and awkward interactions with his opponents. Okay, maybe he's not too shabby after all, but Trick Room is kind of awkward to pull off in PU, and two Pokemon isn't a full team. Trick Room teams can be strong, but there's not really a ton of interesting Trick Room users that are also just straight up better than Meg Cargo at his job, and this was the thing I was trying to avoid. So I decided to pick up Simapore, a somewhat common Scarfer that gave me good coverage with water and ice moves, and Stoutland, a known physical threat that could plow through walls with a choice band equip. Scrappy gave Stoutland an extremely good matchup versus Haunter, who was ubiquitous in the tier. This meant that he could use stab returns to chunk any team, or if they had Laren, he could fire off a superpower and still hit Haunter on the switch in. Resistor or not, this was a second death sentence for Haunter that made piloting Stoutland pretty foolproof. French did wonders versus the strongest special attacker in the tier, Behem, and Wild Charge could be picked up to cover whatever your team has the most issues with. But as good as Scrappy Stoutland is, his real strength lied in his other ability, Sand Rush. With a jolly nature in Sandstorm, Sand Rush Stoutland was the absolute peak of PU speed tier, and with a choice band bolstering his damage output, he became a menace. Since there was no Sandstream users in PU, Stoutland could only rely on other Pokemon running Sandstorm, making the combo clunky but still relatively powerful. So now I need a Sand Setter. And Stealth Rocks, I guess. Good old Stealth Rock. Nothing beats that. I could run Stealth Rock on Mag, but leading Mag didn't seem like a great call, as he can't really take many hits, and using him as a dedicated suicide lead seemed unceremonious for the goals I was trying to achieve. I decided to pick up Torterra, another mon with pretty beefy offenses for Trick Room that could function as a decent tank outside of it. Ice types were ubiquitous in PU, so Torterra wasn't without his difficulties, but good old Mag had his back. Torterra would run both Sand and Stealth Rock, which unfortunately meant he often had to choose between utility and attacking in a given match and couldn't really do both effectively. He'd need another helper to help him set up Sand. Which brings us to our last teammate, Relicanth. Relicanth was a really interesting Pokemon in PU. Access to Head Smash and Rockhead made him a defensive Pokemon with the ability to absolutely nuke a would-be switch in from orbit, should the enemy underestimate how much damage a 150 base power stab move can do. But in case they were aware of how horrifying switching into that is, Relicanth could also run Yawn to force additional switches, racking up Stealth Rock's damage in the meantime. Whirlpool was cheesy, but an important pickup on Relicanth as it ruined the day of Sandshrew, one of the only viable Pokemon on the tier with access to Rapid Spin. Sandshrew also had access to Earthquake, which Relicanth didn't appreciate with even pretty impressive defensive stats, and he resisted Head Smash. As Sandshrew switching into Relicanth had to decide between spinning and using Earthquake before being put to sleep, and a double switch would often lead into a less than stellar answer to Relicanth being snagged by Whirlpool. This combo made switching into him pretty awkward, but Relicanth could not deal with Vileplume, who, as we know, was an absolute monster wall in the tier, and had a 4 times effective stab Giga Drain. Would be pretty cool to have Fire-type to help out in the situation, even if, you know, it doesn't resist Giga Drain. But now we're back to Meg Cargo. We've got a team, but a few things are missing. Two sand setters are nice and give Stellan lots of opportunities to come in and fire off attacks, but one is often a dedicated lead, meaning that it's hard for him to set up sand late game. Yawn and recover are good, but Relicanth is yawning as an integral part of strategy, and because sleep clause is a rule that exists on Pokemon Showdown, two yawns is probably overkill. So here's the final Meg Cargo set, the one that would provide him the most success he'd ever see. Free from insane setup gimmicks, not used as a punchline. He provided support for his team, fulfilling a niche of spreading status, setting up weather, and firing off super effective moves in Trick Room to pick off stragglers. This is the only team in history of competitive Pokemon that I know of where Meg Cargo has been an impressive competitive threat. How impressive? Well, here's where I get into the story within the story. This was the single most dominant team in early Gen 5 PU. Now, this has to be taken with a grain of salt. Like I said earlier, PU was missing top level talent. I say this to illustrate two points. One, the team was strong enough to fully stop mediocre players in their tracks, and two, the players in the tier at my level and above had trouble navigating the inevitable tandem sand setup and trick room contingency plan that Mikargo helped facilitate. There were answers to this team that would come later, but the standard team compositions up until this point really couldn't reliably compete. Stellan would go on to become a defining threat in the tier as he could be run with a few different moves and abilities, making him a difficult and dangerous Pokemon to scout. But no other team running him in competitive play hit the same level of success. He needed support to get his game plan running, and sand and sand setters universally had issues with Vileplume and couldn't use sand without giving up something important. 
Meg Cargo was not the star player of this team, but he led in assists, and was a very versatile addition that harmonized with Simipor and Duosian, who were almost as good at cleaning up games as Stoutland was. Others started running their own similar teams. Some ran Sawsbuck instead of Torterra, some ran Golduck instead of Simipor, some ran Behem instead of Duosian. Meg Cargo was still rare, but he had the distinction of being on the team with the best win rate in the tier, so he was doing something important. But people didn't like this. PU was a tier of gimmicks and goofy bullshit, damn it. It wasn't about running the same thing. It wasn't about being successful. It was about using Ariados. Wait, no. Ariados gets Toxic Spikes and Baton Pass. That's too strong. Ariados isn't allowed either. Forget I said anything. The vibe in PU became the absolute peak of mid-level competitive opinion. If I won, it's because I'm really good, but if I lost, it's because you're a tryhard or weren't playing fair. Things started to break down in Gen 5 PU. Tournaments with prizes were held only to be cancelled and considered invalid once the organizers were eliminated. PU only had unofficial status on Showdown, meaning it had its own ladder but required heavy moderation and reliance on the honor system, as there was no programming done on site to enforce a ban list. People became aggressive and attempted to dethrone the top ranked players using Pokemon magnitude stronger than what was allowed normally. Teams of legendaries and Pokemon with banned abilities started to show up and tank the ratings of the strongest players in the tier and then, eventually, the bans came. Those with influence decided PU had become like all other tiers and needed to be shaken up. It was a tier where conformity was a sin. Oh, I'll never be the darling of the so-called city fathers who talk about what's to be done with- The Sand Rush Trick Room Team. Stoutland, Simapore, Torterra. All banned. Other threats such as Figure Off and Throw were left as is despite being ubiquitous, and two of the only Pokemon strong enough to give the team any real trouble. The team had been specifically targeted despite only the Meg Cargo variant being the one with an astronomical win rate. This was the death of Meg Cargo's only competitive niche in a decade. Time would go on and X and Y would soon release. Simipore, Stoutland, and Torterra would all eventually be unbanned, with Simipore being banned again much, much later, but the damage was done, and I was frustrated about the community mentality of you're only allowed to win if you do it my way. If you're not new to the channel, you also know I can be confrontational myself, so this was not a healthy place to enjoy a hobby. Other players evidently felt the same way as I did though, and the player base of PU would shift into a completely new group of people. After tons of infighting in the community, one of the Poketubers would go on to run a fundraiser because a bully they knew from high school was mean to them in the present day. Detailed in a 20 minute YouTube video uploaded with only audio. I'm like, I'm not admitting anything about that. That was the entire premise of the video, and it worked. They bought a PS4 with the money. One of the more well-known and hostile players in the tier, someone who ghosted on paying out a tournament after they lost, would see the success of this and do the exact same thing. And I'm not kidding. It happened twice. I don't know if they bought a PS4, but it happened. It was the most pathetic ending to the most pathetic tier. With 10 years of perspective, it's just as funny as it is tragic. There are thousands of other stories like this lost to the sandstorms of time. Much of Pokemon's colorful history exists in defunct forum posts, unrecoverable IRC chats, in-person events that went unrecorded, and in the minds of those who lived through it. I'm not bitter about the death and rebirth of PU, and this video exists not as a hit piece on those few figureheads who acted strangely, but entirely as a love note to Meg Cargo, whose story couldn't be told without the drama. Hey, thanks for watching this. If you're new to my channel, I don't really do a lot of Pokemon stuff, I do mostly Monster Rancher. And if you're returning from the channel, don't worry, there's more Monster Rancher stuff coming up. Uh, thanks to my Patreons, I really enjoyed doing something new, and I hope you guys liked it. I'm planning on doing more Pokemon stuff in the future, but this is a story that I've told on stream a bunch of times, and I wanted to get it out there in an actual video format. So, hopefully you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.